us looking for an ear. And today we find about a long history of a problem called Game of Thrones. Um, have you ever played King of the Mountain? Raise your hand if you were foolish enough. Yeah. For those of you who haven't, skip it. It's very painful. I should have learned from listening to my mom. Kids, we could learn a lot from our moms, and I expect moms will probably say amen. Or think. And, and we could avoid a lot of hassle. When I was little, I, my mom would told, told me that she had played King of the Mountain when she was a little girl. So my mom will watch this sometime today, and I love you, Mom. But So back in the olden days, they even played King and, and she told me how she got hurt playing King of the Mountain because that's what happens when you play King of the Mountain. You get hurt. Well, she was playing like they did in the olden days, lived way up in Line Mountain, way up in the north, in the northeast of this country, in where it used to snow. And she says, it used to snow up there more than now. And it used to be cool here in the summer. So, you know, whatever. There's problems. But... She talked about how deep the snow would get, and they would make mountains of snow all the way to the eaves of the second story of the house. And they would play king of the mountain. Now, this sounded fun to me, actually. She was trying to protect me, but she was actually enticing me to sin. She, they, it was, they played king of the mountain on a snow, steep snow mountain going up to the eaves of the house. And she told me how... Uh, and I thought, I, I admit this, Mom, I apologize. I thought, my mom played King of the Mountain. I thought only like cool people, cool kids play King of the Mountain. But even my mom made the mistake of King of the Mountain. And her and her little friends and her older brother, my mountain, and my uncle Judd had fought his way to the top, and he was the king. And all of us who have ever been King of the Mountain know that being a king doesn't last too long. Violence, uprising, and near-death experiences are what happened in King of the Mountain. And he got to the top, and as he got to the top, some, probably multiple people, started to yank him down. And when he went down, he fell. And how did these things happen? His uh, coat button loop caught on one of her teeth. And not only was the king being deposed, his younger sister was going down with him, which happened in a lot of real history. Yanked her too, twisted it, almost took it out, and it was sideways. I thought, gross, but that sounds really cool, because I was a little guy. It came the day where some of my friends would play kick the mountain. But I learned from my mom and her crooked tooth. Fortunately, it was her baby tooth. Glad she's not going around like a hillbilly right now. I played. And I'll tell you what I did growing up, and as I grew bigger in King of the Mountain, I inflicted pain. And other people inflicted pain on me, because that is the way of King of the Mountain. By the time I was a pastor, young pastor, hard for you to believe at this point, out of college in Florida, youth pastor. When you're a youth pastor in Florida, almost every event is a water event. You know it, you know it. We have ocean, we have lakes, we have rivers, they're not too good, but we have lakes and we have ocean. And I was a youth pastor with a wonderful group of youth, and we were having a lake day. People were skiing, and somebody, somebody wealthier than this pastor, had bought an island, not, not a regular one, but a floating island, and used compressors. Have any of you have ever seen like a giant floating island? This thing was big. I mean, you, you could actually stand on it. And, and so what we started out with was jumping from the dock onto the island, but somebody came up with the idea of, let's play king of the island. Why, these rookies, these tiny rookies. And we started to play king of the island, which was even more dangerous because there was deep water involved. <laughs> and people are diving off the dock, knocking kings off of the island, I'm picking them up and chucking them off the island. 
And you'll find it hard to believe that that youth group that loved me so, whenever I was king of the island, came more, become more barbaric than ever. They, they were no longer sweet little Christians. They were barbarian whores. As soon as I'd get to the center of that island, they would all come. I inspired them. There was something in me that drew all the energy out of them, and it was a mob. And you can be big, but in a mob, you can be dead. Earth history, right? What You know how tiring it is to play for hours king of the island? At the end, I don't know how many I chucked, but I looked down. I had, I had youth with nails. I, I, I looked like I was striped. I had cuts on my face. I probably was going to get a black eye from feet and elbows and the loving barbarian youth of my church. Buffy, you can go with the youth here and play king of something, but I'm not going anymore. The last time I was king of the island, I, it, I had the worst pain of all inflicted. I was throwing people as they came. That was my favorite part, just chucking. Chucking people for the Some barbarian horde came behind me, and I didn't know, and they got me. And with your hands and your feet go, and they, they didn't just throw me off this time. They carried me like a human sacrifice to the edge, and they launched me into the air, bringing me closer to the Lord. And I went down, and I went in, you know, feet first, really nice, not a lot of splash. And I went down, and I went down so deep, I went to the bottom. And this was, you know, the lakes in Florida are ugly. Uh, they're good for fish, but they can be muddy. I'm looking at some Florida people. And somehow a shell, I don't know what it was doing there, but one of those long razor shells was stuck in the mud. And when I went down, my foot would just happen of all the places. I hit that thing, and it went up. Oh, that's a bad memory into my foot, and King of the Mountain was over for me at that point. People get hurt playing King of the Mountain, and King of the Mountain, or Game of Thrones, goes back a long way. I mean, it's not just A.D., and it's not even just B.C. I mean, King of the Mountain and Game of Thrones goes all the way back before Eden, so Game of Thrones goes back to B.E. You knew about B.C. Today you're learning B.E. Before Eden. And hard to believe with all those wonderful cherub youth in heaven that the Game of Thrones started there in the heart of a covering angel named Lucifer. And, and let me take you to a passage of Scripture that while it's in the book of Isaiah gives us a glimpse, pulls back pulls back the curtain a little bit. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. How are you fallen? Again, I'm with the ESV. The Bible this time with. How you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. Isn't that a beautiful title? Wasn't that an honor of God? Wasn't it enough? to be at the right hand of Jesus, wasn't it enough to be one of the two closest to God? O oh, day star, son of the dawn, how are you cut down to the ground? I'll tell you how. He played the throne. You who laid low nations, you said in your heart, this is where it happened, I will ascend Stars of God. Set my what? Ah, oh, the first Game of Thrones. And all the other Game of Thrones. I will set my throne high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. There's a lot of eyes in here. I will make myself like who? Ooh. 
but you are brought down to Sheol, to the reaches of the pit. And this prophecy of Isaiah is going to come true. I praise the Lord, it's going to come true. for a long time since Game of Thrones you know what I did you could google it look up pictures look it up on pictures I started looking up ancient thrones to see how great they were you know and I looked at these thrones through history you know and, and I kept finding I'm thinking oh yeah okay whatever and how many of those kings are still sitting on those thrones and how many of those thrones even look decent anymore because it's a game, it's a mirage, and it's a lie. But only pagan, well, I guess not, because angels did it. And sometimes disciples do it. Don't you love seeing the little children come up today? I want you to remember that as I read the next verse. Because you know what was going on amongst the disciples. And they made it sound more spiritual, Probably. But they didn't walk as close to Jesus while they're heading anywhere. They're arguing over who is and where they get to sit. Matthew chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, they asked a lot of dumb questions. I probably got the Who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Calling to him a child. There was one of the little girl putting all that money in there. Wasn't that? I mean, this is priceless. Putting a child in the midst of them said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn, when you see that, Repent. Unless you turn and become like children, he's talking to the twelve, you will never enter where? The kingdom of heaven. So this is important. Verse 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. He's telling them there is no game of thrones. Luke 22, these closest disciples, this dysfunctional family of God, and we are part of that dysfunctional family of God. And isn't it beautiful that Jesus loves us even as we are dysfunctional? But let's let, pray that he'll make us more functional. <laughs> Verse 24 of Luke 22, a dispute also arose among them, which of them was regarded the greatest. Now they're getting more personal. It's not just who will be the greatest in heaven. Now they're arguing over which one of them. You get this, right? Which of them was to be regarded as the greatest? And Jesus said to them, he's going to give them a little lesson in Game of Thrones. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over each other, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the youngest, the leader, as one who serves. And Jesus showed them how it was done with a child and with a basin. The only one worthy of the throne is the one at their feet with a base. And you know how Jesus
There's a demand in the Greek. Satan has demanded you this night. But I have prayed for you. And when you turn back, don't you love that about Jesus? Just looking for you. Just turn on back. You strengthen your brother. Last week, we know that before, there's two little Greek words. You're going to hear them again. I want you to hear. I was going to just skip on by trial. I was going to miss it. Oh, I can't because as I was going through, I found something that I need to bring up to you. We saw Jesus coming to one festival after another, and at them he would say things that matched the festival, the spiritual festival, and he would say things like, I am the bread come down from heaven. And they wanted to kill him when he'd say that because those Jews knew that he was making a claim. I am that I am. I am the living water. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. And they grabbed for stones and he went into stealth mode. Because his time had not yet come. And in the garden, he tells his disciple, get up. It's time. And he looked at them as he heals a man who was his enemy, finds the ear, puts it on. But you knew what he said when they asked, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And when he said, I am, just two Greek words. We know it's he because of the, the, and the look of it. He said, I am, and they all went flying back and down. Because in that brief moment, a tiny bit, just he just let just a tiny amount of his divinity flash through. And, and, and his disciples are like, we're trying to save you. He said, don't you know, I could call 10,000 legions of angels. I could call 10 legions of angels, right? 12 legions, that's what it was. Just like those Romans, right? But he didn't need that, did he? I want you to come to the Gospel of Mark because we've never let that be the focus yet in this series. And I want you to come with me to the council before the high priest found in Mark 14, beginning with verse 53. Jesus has healed Malchus. Judas is running somewhere to throw those 30 pieces of silver into the temple courtyard, probably at the treasury. And those sanctimonious people wouldn't take it because... It was blood money. Of course, they paid for that blood money. And Judas is looking for a place to hang himself, and Peter is denying Jesus just like Jesus said he would. They led him to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together, and Peter had followed him at a distance. Right into the courtyard of the high priest, he was sitting with the guards and warming himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. So the Sanhedrin has been called, but not all of them. Many bore false witness against him, but their testimony didn't agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I'll destroy the temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. He was going to do that. They just didn't understand what it meant. We heard him say, I will destroy the temple. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent. Again, the high priest questioning him, and if you read the other Gospels, has put him under oath. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, okay. That whole night, he'll be going to three places for trial. Sanhedrin, Pilate, Herod. And in it, he hardly says a thing. So when he speaks, listen closely. Because it's really important. He's coming to this as a lamb to slaughter. And when he says something in these trials, you better believe it's meaningful. Are you the Christ, the Messiah, 
Son of the blessed? Son of God. Jesus answered, Ego e me. I have thought because I'm a Halverson and not as Christ-like as I should be. But I have thought I would he'd let just a little tiny bit of his divinity flash through right there when he said, I am the title of God. He says, they go in me, but we know what he's talking about. He is claiming something because of what he says immediately following. And you can be really glad that Jesus said this. And get this, he's under oath. He's in the Supreme Court of Israel. Really, they're on trial. They didn't know it. I am. And you will see the Son of Man, his title. Son of Man, Son of God, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. And this is a beautiful testimony. I've got flowers up here because we have a memorial for our friend Carl. Imagine this, even the courtroom, uh, an illegal court trial, Jesus gives good news for a day like this. I am, <clears throat> and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power in the coming of the clouds of heaven, and the high priest did this on the week of Passover, just hours before he's supposed to have the sacred service of the Passover lamb being slain. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. But it's not blasphemy if it's true. What is your decision? Don't think Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea were there. They didn't get the text. It was too late at night. And why was it so late at night? Because they were afraid of this carpenter and if they had done it in the day, the mob would have taken them off their island. They condemned him as deserving death. Why? For blasphemy from Leviticus. They are going to kill God because he is God. And then they did this. Some began to spit on him covered his face, strike him, saying, prophesy. And right here, you know what's been on my heart all week? The restraint of angel. There'd already been a war in heaven. Do you think Lucifer and his puny band of a third could take them? These angels who love this Lord as their God and their Lord are having to watch these people who call themselves spiritual people and spiritual leaders spitting on the Son of God, slapping and punching and mocking Him. And I think that those angels were like, Jesus, just give the word. We can end this now. And I think Jesus could have just said, you know, I've tried. Even my 12 have failed me. I think I'm going to go home. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured. And we are part of that joy. So I want you to know something about that trial in the Sanhedrin. It was illegal. In the Sanhedrin, it was always supposed to be, you are innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> He's innocent, and you are going to make him guilty. And until God returns, there will still be corruption in high places. Two, you do not hold the Sanhedrin court after sundown. It is against the very laws of the court itself. You cannot have a court meet between sundown and sunrise. And 
that's where they did it because they didn't want Jesus. They didn't want Jesus. They wanted him dead. And they have him on trial. And then they have false witnesses that they have paid off who can't even get their act together. And then, I want you, you may not, when you've read through this and breathe through this, you may not get this. A high priest was never allowed to tear his robe. It was symbolic of something greater than him. It was symbolic of Jesus Christ, the high priest. And he tears his robe, saying Jesus has committed blasphemy and asking for the Son of God's death right before Passover sacrifice. And he did it. But you know what I've been thinking this week? It's all right. It didn't really matter because pretty soon... Not that robe's not going to mean a difference. That temple's not going to mean a difference. When Jesus dies on the cross, something's going to happen in the temple. Unseen hands will rip the curtain in half. I have some bad news. My friend, he was my visiting partner, Calvin, my elder. He, he, he was my prayer partner. We had seen all kinds of miracles. He says, uh, Pastor, I'm sorry to tell you that Joe died today in a car wreck. We need you to come back. So I went. God in late, that little church down in Crawfordville, they took me down. It was filled and the windows were open and people from that little community were all smiling. And if it hadn't been for the little ones, I think she would just rather go lay in there beside her son and you just close that casket. So prayerfully and carefully and slowly, I, I helped lift my friend out of the casket. People visited, people tried to console. A long time later, the church had very few of us. I was walking out to the car so I could go to an airport and fly back. And I saw him. He was always so positive. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He always smiled when he said it. This time he had tears just streaming down his face. He said, he said, Jesus is coming, but it sounded more like a question. Pastor, Jesus is coming? Now it's my turn. Because he had taught me well. I said, yes. 
Jesus is coming. And today, through his word and through his spirit, Jesus has something to say to us in a farce of a courtroom with those who should have been loving, embracing him, and helping him. He said, are you the son of God? Ego a me. And you will see the Son of Man coming to the clouds at the right hand of the Father. So maybe it feels like a long time. Maybe you're having a hard time. and I just don't want you to let go. And I don't want you to let go and give up because like my friend who never got to go to school, who was wiser than Mo said, Jesus is coming. Lord Jesus, you always amaze me. In the hardest places, you never lose your cool. In, in the worst of times, you don't flinch. They lied. They broke their own laws. They beat and mocked you, and you did not retaliate, and you did not let angels of power move. You must love us a lot. Remind us to the depths of our soul today that this is not going to last forever, that you are going to put an end to this, that one day soon, Jesus, just like you promised, you're going to come in those clouds with power and glory, and we will worship you forever. Amen.